life lived by the Lord. Watch him receive your generosity and use it in ways you could never imagine. Okay, okay, sorry about that. Forgive me, uh, good morning. I, 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 got the, uh, I got the belt pack now working. Good to be with you again, Skyline family. I wanna say hello to you as well as welcome the other campuses and our online audience into the room today. Um, are you doing okay? It's gonna get better. Because ladies and gentlemen, today we are going to play the Bible Money Quiz. I'm your host, Tom Mercer, and if you'll take out your game cards, AKA your weekend sermon notes, we will all be playing by answering 10 questions rather quickly, please. Number one, most pastors talk too much about money. Do you agree or disagree? Go ahead and lock in your answers because we're going to question number two. God is more interested in how often I attend and how much I serve at Skyline than he is in how I spend my money. Agree or disagree? Only have a couple of answers, Skyline, so lock in those answers. Number three. God does not consider how I spend my money when he determines how he's going to bless me in the future. Agree or disagree? Number four, I am not a money lover. Answer for yourself. Do you agree or disagree? Number five, the Bible teaches that 10% of my money belongs to God. Agree or disagree? Lock in those answers as we move to number six. If I'm not generous with my money, I can still be thankful to God. Agree or disagree? Number seven, my generosity will help God fulfill the Great Commission. Agree or disagree? Number eight. My generosity will help make ministry easier for Pastor Jeremy and the Skyline team. Agree or disagree? And number nine, I am not a wealthy person. This is not a trick question. Agree or disagree? And last but not least, number 10, I never stress out about the lack of money. Agree or disagree? Thank you, Skyline family, for playing the Bible money quiz, and I'm done being that guy, and I'm back. Uh, my name is Pastor Tom, and I want you to keep those answers handy because I want to walk through that list, and I want you to do something today for us. I want you to compare your answer that you gave while we played that very exciting game and compare the answer you wrote down to what the Bible says. Because I truly believe there will be some minds changed today. Sometimes our perspective becomes somewhat convoluted as we live from day to day under the stress, many stresses of life and the culture that we live in. And the problem is if you think incorrectly, you'll act inappropriately. And I can say that about any particular aspect of your Christian walk. If you think wrongly, you will act wrongly because how we live flows out of how we think. And so today we want to kind of readjust our thinking so that if we need to make lifestyle readjustments, it becomes more, more, um, more likely. So let's look at all 10 of these questions. Now, normally, 
pastors who uh, present on uh, the weekend on stages like this. We have a three-point outline, maybe a four-point outline if we want to push the envelope. Today we have a 10-point <laughs> outline, and so uh, we'll try to be brief because we, we know time is important too. But let's look at that first statement. Most pastors talk too much about money. True or false? <laughs> yes, if you put true, I understand, but that is probably the wrong answer. And I am not tactically defending pastors. In terms of their tactics, that's what I mean. That's a whole different Oprah. I'm not here to defend what some guys, what some gals, what some church leaders say about generosity or about giving or about money. I'm just asking a simple question. Do they talk about it too much? And how much is too much? I mean, Skyline, you probably have had some conversations with someone over the years about how often a guy like Pastor Jeremy can talk about money before you'd start to get a little bit, a little bit offended. And so I'm thinking, well, how often should Pastor Jeremy present the topic to you? I was a pastor for 50 years. I became very comfortable talking about money because I realized it was the biggest problem most people had. And so you would expect that God would talk more about the biggest problems we face. You know that's true for Jesus? I mean, let's just say that uh, Pastor Jeremy, who I think is an amazing pastor, very gifted pastor, very gracious, great friend, and I know you feel that way about him too, but I think he would agree that if we canned him and hired Jesus as the lead pastor of Skyline, that would be a significant upgrade. It would be true for any church. So how often would Jesus talk about money if he was the lead pastor of the Skyline family? Well, the Gospels give us a clue because over half, over half of the parables that Jesus taught dealt with generosity, money, and giving. Actually, overall, the Bible talks about the subject of prayer in 500 different verses. The Bible devotes less than 500 verses to the subject of faith, but over 2,000 verses to the subject of money and how we spend it. In other words, if Pastor Jeremy presented an eight-week series on faith, and, then, and we'd like that because that's important. We need, <laughs> we need to have more faith. And then he followed that up with an eight-week series on prayer using the same ratio that Jesus gives us in the Gospels. Pastor Jeremy would have to follow those two series up with a 32-week series on money. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine this series on money lasting uh, through June of 2025? So, let's be thankful this one is only six weeks long. But secondly, let's also be sure that we listen carefully to what God might want to tell us so that he doesn't have to repeat himself in the future. That's always important. Okay, number two. God is more interested in how often I attend and how much I serve at Skyline than he is on how I spend my money. That statement is? Mm. Oh, it's great. I hope you got that one right because Jesus said this in Luke chapter 16, verse 13. No one can serve two masters. Either you'll hate the one and love the other or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. It's not that you won't serve both God and money. Jesus said you can't. He's saying that we can't leave our money out of the conversation about what it means to serve God. In fact, the opposite is actually true. In chapter 16, verse 11, Jesus said, if you have not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, which is money, then who's going to trust you with true riches, which is serving in the kingdom of God? Jesus said that the eternal significance of our ministries 
even as volunteers at Skyline. The eternal significance of what we do is directly connected to how we spend our money. And we'll see that unfold over the course of the next few minutes. But let's go to number three question or statement. God does not consider how I spend my money when he determines how he's going to bless me in the future. True or false? Yeah, you're probably going to see a pattern developing here in the answers that the Bible gives us regarding these questions. Because how we spend money actually does weigh into his decisions, God's decisions, about the future blessing we enjoy in our lives. God is the source of every level of wealth. I mean, we could even have everybody raise their hand and say how much money they make. And I would say to every single one of you, God is the source of what he has provided you. He's the source of it all. When Paul wrote the Corinthian church in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7, he says, who makes you different from anyone else? You know, that question is very interesting because so often we listen to the Bible taught from this stage, regardless of who's standing here, and somehow we respond by saying, you know, pastor, generally I think what you're saying is true, but I'm an exception. And the reason I'm an exception is this. And Paul says, who makes you different? Who makes me different from everybody else? What do you have, he says, that you didn't receive? And if you did receive it, why do you boast as though you did not? Why do you say, I work so hard for my money? When what you have is what God has provided you. He's the source of it all. He's the one who determines everything, including how much money we're allowed to use in this world. And certainly we give honor to God by how we spend it. We give honor to God in being generous and we don't want to be generous just to get more. But Jesus said, it is what it is. Luke chapter six, verse 38, he said, give and it'll be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, Shaken together and running over will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. In other words, if you want God's measure of generosity to be, to be larger toward you, then your measure of generosity needs to be larger as well. Give and it'll be given to you. You know, whenever you've had conversations over the course of your life, and for those of you who are married, I'm sure these, <laughs> these conversations occur um, frequently. You know, what do we do? Uh, we don't have enough. And you start to brainstorm. And most of the time, the things that are on your list of ways to generate more wealth for you or for your family includes things like, well, Maybe I should go in and ask for a raise. Maybe I just ought to have a come to Jesus meeting with my boss and tell him, listen, I just need a raise. Or maybe I need to quit. Maybe I need to get a better job. Maybe my spouse should get a job. Maybe I should go in and ask if I can work overtime. Or maybe we need to get a second income. Now, I'm not saying that you shouldn't talk to your boss about getting a raise. Maybe you deserve it. I'm not saying that you shouldn't quit your job and, get a, and, and try to get a, a job that, that pays better. Maybe you should. I do know one thing. The Bible identifies a primary way to generate um, more wealth. One thing. How generous are we? And God says, if you need more, then give some of what you have away. No, he seriously says that. He says, think about what you could use more of. And then take some of what you already have of that, whatever it is, and give it away. For example, you might be thinking, I got too many things to do today. I'm not going to fit all of the, the, the assignments, the tasks 
you know, all these things I have to do today. You know, Lord, how am I going to accomplish it all? And what does God say? Well, take a few minutes of the time that you have today and give it to me. And so you spend time with the Lord. Some people say, I don't have enough time in the week. Well, then give God a piece of your week, a piece of the seven days he's already given you, and go to church, which you evidently did today. If you don't have enough money in your wallet, then take some of the money that you already have in your wallet and give it away. And you say, Pastor Tom, that doesn't make any sense. And my response is, I know. I'm not here to make sense. I'm just here to tell you what Jesus said. Because we all claim, to some degree, we want to be Jesus followers. Give, and it will be given to you. And I would say hard work is a virtue. I say that because the Bible said. But the Bible never says work harder and it will be given to you. Prayer is a virtue. But the Bible doesn't say pray more and it will be given to you. What does the Bible say? Give and it will be given to you. Number four, you're going to like this. I am not a money lover, true or false. And I'm sorry I had to answer for you, but the Bible is very incriminating at times. And there's a passage in the book of Ecclesiastes that I just hate. And it just provides this big mirror for me to see myself for who I really am. And before we read that passage, I just want to give you the am I a money lover test. Um, and you can answer these questions just in your mind. There's only two. So you'll remember them. I do not have enough money. Agree or disagree? And I don't even know why I ask. I already know what you're going to say. And then number two, I do not make enough money. Agree or disagree? And most of us in this room, maybe all of us in this room to some degree would say, I would agree with both statements. And that's why we come to this verse that I don't like. Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 10, whoever loves money never has enough. Whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with their income. Congratulations, you passed with flying colors. You see what has happened? Money is so powerful. It has already blinded us into believing that we're not who we actually are. Money always promises to make our life better. More money, better life. That's why people tend to love it so much. The problem is when you just chase after it, it usually destroys you. And that's what Paul wrote in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 10. He told Timothy, the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, and some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Number five, the Bible teaches that 10% of my money belongs to God. True or false? <laughs> yeah, that is false because actually the Bible says 100% of the money in your accounts belongs to the Lord, 100%. You say, seriously? Pastor Tom, I've always... I've always believed that I'm supposed to give 10% because the 10% is the Lord's. Well, then you need to read a verse. This is a really good verse. Not that any of the verses God wrote are not good verses. However, this one is especially good today. Let's read it together out loud. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. That may be the lamest public reading of the scriptures I have ever shared with an audience. I will give you one more chance out loud together. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. Do you see what I mean when I say 100% of the money in your accounts belongs to the Lord? Because I have the assumption that all of your accounts are on planet Earth. Now, if you've got investments somewhere else, you know, all bets are off. But I'm just saying, 
If you made a thousand bucks this week on this planet, all one thousand dollars belongs to God. Not one hundred of it. A very common question that we get asked, and as we have taught these principles over the years so often, and believe me, it was a challenge, and my comfort level of teaching about money became really high. I mean, I, I, I'm just here to help you. You know, pastors get up and talk, talk about money. People sitting in the audience think, okay, Pastor Tom wants, wants us to help him. I, I'm, I, you're not helping us. The Bible is always here to help you. And so whenever I would teach these principles, sometimes uh, people would say, and I'd get emails, and people are great. Just sometimes we all have asked really stupid questions. A common question is, how much of my money do I have to give to God? You know why that's a stupid question? Because it's based on an incorrect assumption that you have any money that belongs to you. See, if you think incorrectly, you'll start to act inappropriately. What, what would be a good way to frame the question? This is a good question. How much of God's money do I get to spend on myself? Number six, if I'm not generous with my money, I can still be thankful to God. What is the answer? Yeah, I don't think you can. Did you know that every expenditure you make in your life is a thank you note? It's true. Whether you click, I know, you know, with digital banking and payments, sometimes we make a payment or we pay a bill by clicking. Sometimes we write a check. Sometimes we might actually walk down to an office, some of us, because we like to deal with cash and we pay for a particular uh, commodity or a particular service with cash. However you, however you spend money, every single time you're writing a thank you note. Why do, why do you direct money to the gas company? And I'm assuming you got gas coming into your homes. Why do you do that? Why do you write them a check? Why do you, why do you pay online? Because you're thankful for their gas. What would you do if you needed their gas and they wouldn't give it to you? Why do you direct money to the grocery store? You're thankful for their food. Now I know when you're standing in line checking out, you're thinking this is costing me a fortune. But rather than checking out of the grocery store with that mindset, why don't we start thinking, I am just gonna be thankful today. And when you hand that thank you note, that check, or you put in that card, it's a plastic little all service thank you note system called a debit card. And you put that in their little machine, you're saying, thank you. Dude, I don't even know how to make potato chips. I mean, what would I do? And, and yet these people, yet this grocery store, out of the kindness of their heart, they went out and figured out who makes potato chips. And then they figured out a way to package them so conveniently so I could go home and watch the game. I'm thankful to the grocery store. That's why I write a thank you note every time I leave. Why do you direct money to the feds? Uh, yeah, this is, this is the tough one. Well, I'm thankful honestly thankful that I don't have to build my own F-22 Raptor to defend my family against terrorism. I'm, I'm, you know, there's a lot going on in the world today. I don't know if, what news feed you watch, but they're all kind of saying the same thing. The world's pretty jacked up. And there are a lot of people dying today. And the reason that you won't leave today hearing explosions is because of the feds. I'm thankful, I live in the high desert. I'm thankful I don't have to build my own roads. I'd be driving in sand, you guys. I'd be getting stuck every day. I don't even know how to operate heavy equipment. 
but I don't have to worry about it. So whenever I pay the government, and the funny thing is about writing a thank you note to the government, they thank themselves before I even get paid, you know? <laughs> but we're not paying bills, Skyline family, not anymore. You'll never pay bills again. What you're going to do is write thank you notes. And you're going to be thankful to all of these people. What, gr what a grateful church family writing thank you notes every month as a matter of strategy. And why do we direct money to the Lord's work? Why do we write checks to Skyline Church? Because we're thankful to God for what? For everything. And by the way, God says, when you're making out your thank you notes, make sure you make out the thank you note to God first. I mean, are we more thankful to the gas company than we are to God? We don't say, well, of course not. Then write that thank you note in the order, write those notes in the order of what or who you're most thankful for. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 9. Honor the Lord with your wealth. With the, uh, what? First fruits. You know what that means? That means just write that thank you note first. And then, verse 10 is brilliant. Then your barns will be filled to overflowing, and your vats will brim over with new wine. I mean, verse 10 is what you want. Verse 9 is how you get it. That's why I say never give out of your leftovers. I, people have told me for four decades, past Tom, we'd love to give. But there's never, at the end of the month, there's never anything left over. And I've always said, that's the problem, man. You can't give out of your leftovers. Giving out of your leftovers means... You're not giving by faith, number one. And that's a problem. Because the writer of Hebrews said without faith, it's impossible to please God. But number two, <laughs> there's never anything left over. And there never will be. Ever. But when you give first, it's amazing how everything else falls into place. That's why God said to do it. That's why Jesus said when it comes to money, and in Matthew chapter 6, he was talking about money. He was talking about finances. He was talking about God's provision. And he said in verse 33, just seek first his kingdom. First his kingdom and his righteousness. And then all this other stuff will be added to you. You just got to invert the order of your thank you notes. And you might be saying once again, Pastor Tom, that doesn't make sense. And I would respond the same way I did a minute ago. I know. It's a miracle, is what it is. Your gifts to the Lord are to be as strategic as every other piece of your monthly budget. As regular as the rest of your expenditures. And you write that first. Number seven, my generosity will help God fulfill the Great Commission. True or false? <laughs> yeah, that's not true. See, your generosity will not help God do anything. Because God doesn't need your help. God doesn't need anybody's help ever. God does not need your financial help. Let's just say he did. Let's just say he and the angels are talking one day. You know, they're up there in the great beyond. And God calls an emergency staff meeting. And he says, listen, fellas, I'm a bit short this month and I don't know what to do. And the angels come up with all kinds of ideas on how to generate more income for God. Do you think any of them would suggest that God talk to you? <laughs> hey, Bob, I'm a little short this month, and I was just wondering. No, he doesn't need your money in the least. So why do you still need to give it? Because this has never been about helping God. This has never been about helping the church. This is about God helping you become more like him. Number eight. Ooh, this is good. 
My generosity will help make ministry easier for Pastor Jeremy and the Skyline team. That is false. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for that reminder. More money will not make Skyline's ministry easier. Actually, it makes Skyline's ministry more difficult. See, I would be standing up in front of an audience every so often we teach these principles as the church grow and so many people had never heard them before and so many perspective needed to be shifted to a biblical way of thinking. And we would minister up there uh, in a region of California, the highest uh, percentage of government assisted families in the state of California was the parish I served for 38 years. And so I would tell that audience the same thing I'm telling you because the Bible is the same no matter where you, no matter where you teach it. And I would say, listen, if you give more money, we will do more ministry and impact more people. God will give us that great privilege. But if you give less money, my life becomes much easier because I have less ministry to oversee. I have fewer people to try to help. I have less counseling to provide and I have less staff to manage. Every time Skyline decides they are gonna be obedient to God and give God the chance to do in their lives what he's always wanted them to do, and that's just to trust him. And you become faithful and generous in your giving. Every time you do that, these poor people, their lives just get much harder. And you know what? That's what they want. Because our life is too short and our calling is too great to let disobedience keep us from fulfilling the challenge God has extended us as a church. God doesn't need your money. Why? The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. He doesn't need your money because he already has it. And by the way, because he already has it, he can do whatever he wants with it. He just wants you to learn how to trust him more. Number nine, I am not a wealthy person. That answer is, <laughs> you were thinking all the way through one through eight. He can't possibly think we're rich. If I asked you if you were tall, you would not take offense, especially those of you who say six, two and up, you know, Jeremy size people. You say, yeah, well, I guess, I guess I'm tall, that's dumb. But if I asked you the question, are you rich? Virtually all of you would say, no, I'm not rich. But is that what the Bible says? And actually, is that even what the data tells us? Where would you be on this scale? This is why the Skyline team just went above and beyond this weekend so I could, I could help make an impression on you. Over here, this is, your income is somewhere on this line. In fact, everybody's income in the entire world is on this line somewhere. Now the poorest dude in the world, and I don't have any idea who this cat is, but he is somewhere and he doesn't even know it. But he's like, you know, you're the poorest man in the human race. And he would say, no, I didn't know that. Some of you might be thinking, I don't think that's me, but maybe that is me. That's the poorest guy in the world. Over here is our friend Elon. We love Elon. You guys might not be able to see Elon's face. Richest dude in the world. Now, your income is somewhere here between him and him. And I'm just gonna ask you, where is it? You'd probably not say here. By the way, we did this pre-service with a few folks and virtually all the time, they said, no, I'll move it a little further over, over, over. And then right in this range, people said, yeah, that's me. Is that what you're thinking? Well, let me tell you, if you make $32,000 a year pre-tax, 32, and I know some in here may not make that, but if you make 32, this is where, this is where you are. No, there. 
$32,000 a year pre-tax, and you're in the top 1% of the world's wealthiest people. See, you walked in here thinking you weren't rich. And if you think incorrectly, you will act inappropriately. And then you come to verses like this one. Paul writing Timothy again, command those who are rich. See, if five minutes ago I would have read that verse, she would have said, oh, I'm out. At least there's a passage in the New Testament that doesn't implicate me in the least. And now you know this does implicate you. Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant. And that word command is not, hey, you might suggest to these people. He said, Timothy, when you get up and preach next weekend, you, you command them to stop acting arrogant and not to put your hope in wealth, which is so uncertain. The world's Financial systems are so uncertain. They are so risk-oriented. He said, but put your hope in God. I love the verbiage. Who richly provides us with everything because he wants us to enjoy life. Put your hope in God. You know, those are the two options. Every one of us in this auditorium, in these rooms, online, every one of us place our hope for the future either in the world's wealth or in God. Where have you placed your hope? This is not a natural thing to do, you guys. It is not a popular thing to do. It is not a cultural thing to do. But it is the right thing to do, to trust God. Number 10, and last, I never stress out about the lack of money. So predictable. We all have to say, what? Yeah, I'm sorry. We all get too stressed too often. I've never met anyone who doesn't stress out over money, at least some of the time. But you know what stress reveals? You know what our anxiety reveals? It reveals trust issues. That's all. And that's why the writer of Proverbs, Solomon himself, said, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. Some of you are leaning, let's just say, your understanding was a pillar. What you think, what you know, what you predict, what you believe, and you're just leaning on it. Lean not on your own understanding, but in all your ways, all your ways. When it comes to your wife or husband, that way. When it comes to raising your kids, that way. When it comes to spending your money, that way. In all your ways, submit to God. And what will he do? He'll make your path straight. This should not be something that's new to you. You believe you can trust God, right? I mean, you're here on a beautiful Sunday morning inside an auditorium. I mean, okay, we're having a blast, but you could be doing so many other things. But you're here because you say, I trust God. I want to trust him more. And he says, then trust me with your money. And if God says, give regularly, then do it. If he says, give first, then do it. If he says give a certain amount, then do it. Because if you do it, the outcomes will be far better than if you don't. Money is a burden you don't have to carry. You don't have to have any more conversations with God on the defensive. You don't have to say, I know God, you wrote the Bible for us, but I'm the exception and this is why. You don't have to slide down in your seat and feel guilty every time the subject comes up in church because you will never again be on your own financially, ever. Last blank of the day, God cannot give anybody support until they lean on him. And that's what we're calling you to do today.
by faith, lean on God. Jesus said, where your treasure is, that's where your heart is. Jesus said, the things you care about are reflected in your bank statement. That's what Jesus said. Let's pray together. Thank you, Lord. We're glad not only to be part of the Skyline family, we're just glad that we have pastors like Jeremy and so many other wonderful people who lead this church family. And without shrinking back, without um, allowing the fear of being accepted or liked would keep any of them from teaching clearly the actual words of God to these people that they love so much. I pray that you would help us to put into action the words that we have always believed and have said and have told our kids and have told our friends, we trust God. Help us to do it. Help us to do it in this area of money that frankly can be so scary because the world is scary, but you're not. So thanks for drawing near to us today and giving us a sense of your presence and a new sense of direction. And you might be watching or listening. You might be in this room or one of our others around the country or even in your living room watching online. And you might have been prompted by the Spirit of God to give him your whole life. A, B, C, admit, believe, choose. Admit that you've been doing it your way for far too long. The Bible calls that sin. And you need to admit that you're a sinner. And then believe that Jesus was sent by the Father to save the world. And you're in the world. And he loves you but you need to choose to place your faith in Jesus. If you'd like to know more about what that means, you can, you can certainly talk in the lobby or talk to one of the leaders at Skyline or email or call the office or something, but you can choose Jesus today. And Father, I pray that we would. Whatever level of faith we have, wherever we are on this journey, with you. I pray that we would take the next step and that our faith would grow. In Jesus' great name, all God's children said, amen. Well, we're gonna give it back to our campuses now. And for those of you who are here in Rancho de la San Diego, uh, thank you for coming. And to him who is able to do exceeding abundantly more than anything you can ever imagine he could do for you according to the riches we have in Christ Jesus. God speed, God bless, and you're dismissed.